Hi everybody, in this video we're going to learn how to use pre-trained models to perform image classification. We've already seen how we can train a simple neural network to classify images from the CIFAR-10 dataset, but this was a rather simple task since there were only 10 classes. Classifying a larger number of object types will require much larger networks containing many millions of parameters. Thanks to the ImageNet project, Pre-trained models are available in Keras that have been trained to detect objects from 1,000 different classes. So with just a few lines of code, we'll learn how to use these pre-trained models out of the box to perform image classification with no training required. Before we cover the coding implementation in this notebook, we wanted to first describe ImageNet and ILS VRC. The ImageNet project was conceived several years ago for the purpose of creating a large visual database designed to support object recognition software research. This project gave birth to the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, which is an annual competition in which researchers are able to evaluate their models for various recognition tasks like object classification and object localization. And thanks to the contributors of many research teams, Keras comes bundled with many pre-trained ImageNet models. If you'd like to read more about ImageNet and ILS VRC, we've provided references for you here. As of Keras 2.11, there are 19 different pre-trained models available. In this notebook, we'll take a look at using three of the models to make predictions on several sample images. To use any of these models in Keras, there's four basic steps required. We first need to load the pre-trained model into memory. Once we pre-process the images, we can then call the model's predict method to generate predictions. And then as a convenience, we can decode those predictions using a dedicated post-processing function also provided in the model. Before we jump into the coding examples, we'll first give a high-level view of the API in Keras and we'll do so with the ResNet50 model as an example as we walk through the basic steps. So here we call the built-in model ResNet50 to instantiate the ResNet50 pre-trained model. Notice that the function has several optional arguments, which provide a lot of flexibility for using the model in different ways. But the default settings allow you to use the model right out of the box to perform image classification from the 1,000 classes in the ImageNet dataset. So if the classes that you're interested in are contained in the ImageNet dataset, then you should be able to use these models directly for your application. We're not going to cover all these input arguments here, but it's worth mentioning the first two. Include top, which is set equal to true by default, means to use the model's trained classifier. And weights equals ImageNet means use the weights that were trained on the ImageNet dataset. So this is what we want to do in this situation. But in a future video, we'll explore how to leverage these pre-trained models for specialized classification tasks, which will require different settings to these two inputs. After we load the model into memory, we then need to pre-process our images. We'll first need to resize them so they conform to the expected size of the network. But keep in mind that when these models were trained on the ImageNet dataset, the input images were pre-processed in a specific way. We've already seen some examples of pre-processing image data in previous videos, but it's important to emphasize that whatever pre-processing was performed on the training data set, our sample images must be pre-processed in the same way. And for that purpose and convenience, each of the models in Keras includes a dedicated pre-processing function called preprocess input. After pre-processing the input images, we then need to pass them to the model's predict method as shown here. But there's one small implementation detail that we'll need to take care of first. Normally, when working with deep learning frameworks and predefined data sets, the image data has already been packaged in the expected format for the model. Specifically, the image data is stored in a rank four tensor that contains a batch dimension in the first axis. So what this means is that we need to add a batch dimension to our images so that they can be processed by the models. Since we're going to read the images from the file system, we'll need to reshape that data even though we plan to process one image at a time. As an example, ResNet50 expects color images with the shape of 224 by 224 by 3. 
but the model is expecting a tensor that has a batch dimension in the first axis. So we'll see how this is done further below when we take a look at a convenience function that we're going to create to process all the images. The predictions returned by the predict method will contain an array of the class probabilities for all 1,000 classes. And fortunately, there's a convenience function available for decoding those predictions returned by the model. It turns out that there's actually two versions of this convenience function. There's a model-specific version, and then there's one associated with the ImageNet Utils package. Both have the same API, and either one can be used to decode the predictions from the model. These functions return a list of the top K predictions with a default of 5, along with the class IDs and the class descriptions, which are the class names. So this makes it really easy to parse and report the results. So let's go ahead and continue on and take a look at the images that we're going to use for the examples below. In the first code cell, we're using the glob function to read the path names for each image file from the file system. And then in the next code cell, we're just enumerating over the list of file paths and displaying the images to the console. Each of these images has a representation in the ImageNet data set. So here we have a baseball player, an anemone fish, also known as a clownfish, an African elephant, a forklift, ice cream, lemons, a magnetic compass, and a polar bear, otherwise known as an ice bear in the ImageNet data set. Remember that there's 1,000 classes in the ImageNet data set and even though these are very clear and distinct images, many of them do share characteristics with other classes. So it'll be interesting to take a look at how these models perform on them. At this point, we're now ready to load each of the models in the memory as shown in the first code cell. And then just for verification, we can print out the required shape for each model. Notice that the first axis is specified as none, but represents a placeholder for the required batch dimension in the first axis. As we mentioned previously, we're going to define a convenience function called process images, which performs all the required processing to prepare the image data and retrieve the predictions from the model. This function has four required arguments and two optional arguments. The first argument is the model. The second argument is the list of file paths to the images on the file system. The third argument is the spatial size of the image required for the particular model. And the fourth argument is a reference to the preprocessing function for that model. We then have two additional optional arguments that give us the flexibility to display the prediction probabilities for the top K predictions to the console. The processing in this function is fairly straightforward, but there's a couple of things that are worth mentioning. So let's just take a quick look at uh, what's happening here. So at the top of the function, we're going to loop over each of the images. And for each image, we're going to use a uh, TensorFlow function called readFile to read the contents of the image into a byte string. And then there's a corresponding TensorFlow function called decodeImage, which we can use to decode the byte string into a numeric representation. So the uh, decoded image variable now contains a numeric representation for the image. We're then going to resize the image to the specified size for the model. And then at this point, we're ready to add a batch dimension to the image. And to do that, we can use the TensorFlow function called expand dims, which takes the resized image as input along with the axis to specify the location for the new dimension. At this point, we're then ready to call the preprocess input function. And again, this is an input argument, which is a reference to the function that's specified in the model. And that returns for us a preprocessed image which we can then pass to the model's predict method on the next line below. And that returns for us a list of 1,000 predictions for each of the classes in the ImageNet data set. And then finally, as a convenience, we can decode those predictions to retrieve a list of the top K predictions based on the probability scores. So uh, decoded preds is going to contain a list of the top five predictions. This next bit of code here optionally will print out the top K predictions to the console. And then the remainder of this code will display the input image to the console along with the class name associated with the top prediction, as well as the corresponding probability for that prediction. 
So now that we've defined this function, let's proceed to the next section in the notebook and use it to make some predictions. We're going to start with the VGG16 model, which we've already loaded into memory. And here we're indicating the spatial size required for the model, which is 224 by 224. And uh, we're also saving a reference to the preprocess function for that model. And then in the final line of code, we're calling the function with the model, the list of image paths, the size for the model, and the specific preprocessing function. As you can see in the results below, each of the images is displayed along with the class prediction and the probability associated for that top prediction. It's a little bit curious that the baseball player is only at 50% accuracy, but we'll study that further below. And then also notice that the top prediction for the magnetic compass is a combination lock. And although this is incorrect, the misclassification is understandable since a combination lock has comparable features and is visually similar to a compass. It's also interesting that the African elephant only has a confidence of 52%, but remember that there's other classes in the data set that are very similar. For example, ImageNet contains different types of elephants. So next, let's move on to the ResNet 50 model and see how that performs on the same set of images. Across the board, these predictions look quite a bit better. For example, the baseball player has a higher confidence, and the magnetic compass was correctly identified with nearly a 92% probability. And then also notice that four other images actually exceeded 99% confidence. Let's now take a look at the final model, which is Inception V3. And this time, we'll use the optional argument display top k equal to true to print out the top two predictions for each image, which should give us a little more insight regarding some of the classifications. The first thing to notice is that all these images were correctly classified and that all the probability scores were also fairly high. Notice that for the baseball player, the second highest predicted class was a baseball. And even though it's pretty clear that the baseball player is the dominant content in this image, the fact that the second highest score is a baseball certainly makes a lot of sense. Then right next to that, we have the anemone fish at just over 92% probability. But notice that the second highest class is a sea anemone, which is the green area around the fish. And since these two classes make up a significant portion of the image, these two top predictions are pretty striking. Another interesting uh, classification is that the uh, second class for the magnetic compass is a stopwatch. And like the combination lock, a stopwatch also has a lot of the same features uh, that are present in the magnetic compass. So many of these results are really impressive, especially considering that there's 1,000 unique classes in the data set, and that oftentimes multiple classes are contained within an image frame, and yet the model seems to respond appropriately when you start looking at the second, third, and fourth predictions, for example. In fact, one of the criteria in the annual competition is to score the top prediction and also whether or not the true class was in the top five predictions. While these results are impressive, what's even more exciting is that it's possible to customize these pre-trained models for your own application. For example, if you um, have a particular application that requires classes not contained in ImageNet, you can still start with a pre-trained ImageNet model and then use your own data set to repurpose the model for a new application. In the next video, we'll discover how to leverage pre-trained models in this way with techniques known as transfer learning and fine-tuning. We hope you found this video helpful. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.